Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for When Customers Win, You Win, How to Deliver Value That Transforms Your Customer Experience, presented by Customer Experience Update and sponsored by GuideCX. I'm Tori, the Webinar Coordinator of Customer Experience Update, and I'm excited to bring you this first session on why customer onboarding is critical to your success and practical tips to help you achieve your growth goals. I'm really looking forward to speaking with Donna Weber in what I'm sure will be an illuminating conversation. Also, we will be recording this webinar in case you need to leave early. If you happen to miss any part of today's presentation, you can go to the session landing page to access the recording. We will be sending you the link to that landing page in the chat box right now. Up next. Before we go any further, I want to thank GuideCX for sponsoring this webinar and helping us to make this happen. GuideCX is a client onboarding and project management platform that keeps your client at the center every project by providing complete visibility into the work. Invite everyone to the project, internal resources, customer teams, and third-party vendors. Guide each step and stay on track with automated tasks, reminders, and updates. Engage teams by enabling them to interact with the project in the way they prefer. They can complete tasks, use status, send updates, make notes, and more through the portal, email, or mobile app. GuideCX helps you deliver projects faster with viewer issues and accelerate time to value for your customers. For more information, visit GuideCX.com and follow on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. So thanks again, GuideCX. Up next. Let's get some technical things out of the way. Please feel free to ask questions during today's session. You can do so by submitting them into the questions panel on the right side of your screen. Don't forget to stick around until the end of our Q&A session to get even more fresh insight from our panelists. My wonderful colleague, Gravon, will be fielding your questions today. She'll be happy to answer anything you might have. And to disapprove it, you can type hello into the questions panel to so let her know that you're listening. Lastly, if you have any audio issues during today's presentation, you may choose to dial in by phone. You can do so by selecting the More button in the upper right portion of your screen and then selecting the Switch to Phone option. The dial-in information is also available on the screen, but Ravon can relay it to you at any point if you need it. Up next. Again, I'm really excited to hear from Donna Weber, the world's leading expert in customer onboarding. So without further ado, take it away, Donna. Thank you, Tori, and thank you everyone for investing your precious time with me today. I'm really excited to talk about how you can, you know, take your career, your company, your product, new heights, because when you, you focus on your customers, then uh, you are more successful. So um, I like to get some interaction with you. So type in, in the Q&A section, just type in where you're joining from today. I am joining from uh, the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and it's just starting to get a little sunny. And uh, so type in where you're joining from, and thank you for joining from wherever uh, you are. So first question, where do you focus at your business, at your company? Do you focus on your product or do you focus on your customers? I want you to ask yourself that question and you can also type it into the Q&A. Are you more focused on you know, going live with your product, training on your product, going, you know, new releases on your product, or are you focused on the customers and the people who are using your product? It's an important question. Uh, today, we're going to articulate what neuroscience has to do with customer onboarding. We're going to move from a transactional focus to really partnering with your customers. And then we're going to really dive into how you can deliver customer value to transform their business and transform yours. Now, I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A panel. Tori and uh, Rayvon, are you seeing people typing in there? Yes, I can read some of those responses. Okay, off great, because I don't, just... I don't see anything here. Yes, yeah, so we have a lot of people saying they're focusing on customers, the okay. people, very customer focused, the customers and the people, a lot of both. Okay, good, thank you. All right, so just a bit about me. As I said, I'm based in um, Northern California. I wrote the book Onboarding Matters. If you haven't had a look, it you know, really goes into a lot of the detail what we're covering today, if you want to dive in further. Here's a handful of companies that I've worked uh, for in my career and with as a, I have my own business. I help high growth companies transform new and existing customers into loyal champions 
And then when I'm not helping companies grow, um, I love the outdoors. So I love hiking. I'm just getting into mountain biking. And then this is me whitewater kayaking on the American River in California. Okay, so uh, th this is just a bit about me and the, and the results that I see when I uh, work with companies. I help companies get to the next level. And these are the these this is these are the results of what we're talking about today so we'll come back to this but you know if you want to improve your renewal rates increase your net retention increase customer lifetime value decrease costs increase product usage then keep listening okay so here are some challenges you might be facing and i'd love to know if you um if this sounds familiar to you so one are your customers failing to launch. You know, I talked with um, a, a, a colleague yesterday and he was saying so many of the of the companies he's working with, the um, the customers fail to launch. They don't even get to the first year renewal. Um, so customers don't get beyond their implementation. What about customers ghosting you? Does that sound familiar? You know, as much as you try to help them, they don't respond to your calls, they don't respond to your emails, they just kind of disappear. And then there's the trough of disillusionment. Now this is um, from the, uh, based on the Gartner hype cycle. And this is where, you know, we build these great expectations with our customers during the buyer journey. The deal is sold and then the customers might be sitting around for weeks or months or even more than a year waiting for the product to be deployed and use it. So they fall into the trough of disillusionment. And many companies that I work with, their customers, their new customers are pausing and canceling their payments because they're so frustrated. And then are you relying on reactive heroics? So now you've got all these customers, they're ghosting you, they're failing to launch, they're uh, pausing and canceling payments. And so you got to put on the cape, you got to put on the uh, superhero suit, and you got to pull some all nighters, you got to parachute in teams to save accounts uh, to make sure that they stick around and they, they, um, they don't cancel on you. So I'd love to know if that sounds familiar. Type into the Q&A what sounds familiar. And Tori, if you can read out what, what you're seeing. Absolutely. Go ahead and get those responses in. And Someone said it, all of it. All sounds familiar. Customer <laughs> ghosting. Too many heroics. The heroics definitely familiar. Fail to launch. Ghosting. A lot of the same answers coming in here. Okay, great. So it sounds familiar to you. So um, what I would uh, what 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 happens is that poor onboarding is the main cause of churn because we've talked about poor implementations where customers fail to launch if you have weak relationship building and poor customer service that all equates to onboarding for me and that comes to 53 percent for the leading causes of churn and that's costing companies in the u.s alone 136 billion dollars a year and so you know what i focus on is how do we you know, we're all familiar with the sales funnel where you start with a lot of people and you, you know, qualify leads, you, you, you know, you, you get them, you move them through the funnel and then you close a deal. But on the customer journey, we also have a funnel. So this is like the sales funnel on its side. And I call this the customer success bow tie. We also have a funnel on the right side during the customer journey, because when customers are onboarded effectively, when they don't fall into that trough of disillusionment, when they adopt your product effectively, when they then they're gonna buy more, they're gonna use more, they're gonna consume more, and then they're gonna tell everyone they know how awesome your product is. And the reality is there's this huge expansion on the right side. And that's why when customers win, you win, because the more successful they are with your product, the more successful you are. And the reality is that between 50 to 80% of a company's revenue, even in startups, comes from your existing customers. And so this funnel is really important. And you know, the, I have this quote from uh, Mark Rawls that says, when customers adopt your product quickly, they'll renew forever. So we really wanna focus on the beginning of the relationship to not just hope they get value, but to ensure that they love your product they keep using it 
they buy more and they tell everyone they know. So let's talk about the neuroscience of onboarding because this is why the beginning of the customer relationship has so much more importance than the whole rest of the customer journey probably combined. So first of all, the way our brains work is that we are wired to resist. And I read a great book by Britt Andriata called Wired to Resist. And what happens is by nature, uh, due to neuroscience, which we'll talk a bit more in a moment, is that um, uh, we, as people, we don't like what's new. We don't like uh, getting out of our comfort zone. We, are, we like to stay with what's familiar. So maybe you just closed a deal with an important customer. You're excited to get started. Things are good, but then you know you meet a lot of resistance. So type in resistance if that comes up, and then let me know uh, what you see there, Tori. So you you might think that they'd be excited, but then everyone's kind of dragging their feet. Definitely getting a lot of responses stating resistance. Yeah, and you might notice this even for yourself. Like let's say you sign up for a new gym and you want to look and feel great, but then you resist actually going to the gym. So let's explore why those customer relationships are so important, why the beginning of a customer relationship directly affects the final outcome and why we are uh, wired to resist. Okay, so what happens is we have uh, 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 the, the brain, it's like the lizard part of the brain, um, which is like the back of the brain. And I am no neuroscientist, so these are just things I've learned because I'm interested in this. What happens is that initially, whenever we are faced with something new, our brain goes into you know fight, flight, fear, or are we safe? We go into are we in danger or are we safe? So we go into some immediate, like before we, it's very um, subconscious. We don't even know we're doing this. When we meet someone new, so for example, you're meeting with a new customer, they're going to be doing these judgments of you, which are called confirmation bias, um, where, where they judge you, are they safe? Are you a friend or a foe? And if you don't feel safe, they're going, going to go into that fight and flight and freeze responses, which I'm sure you know about. So what happens is that uh, the buyer might feel some buyer's remorse, especially when they're falling into that trough of disillusionment that we talked about. They go into prospection where they create these stories where uh, maybe they've heard some stories from the sales rep or they start, let's say uh, the deal closes and they don't hear from anyone for two weeks, they're gonna start creating some worst case scenario stories in their head. Usually when we ruminate or prospect, we don't do best case scenarios. We usually worry and start creating worst case scenarios. And just a simple story for myself, recently I was working with a vendor for my house uh, for um, solar panels. We ended up not being able to get them, but the, uh, you know, we, we talked to several vendors, we did all of our research and analysis, we picked a vendor, we paid our deposit, and then we didn't hear from them for two weeks. And I started going, you know, we've lost our money, what have we done? We could have gone with another vendor. And we don't want our customers to start creating those stories. And then what happens is when we have that initial judgment, that initial snap judgment, that initial first impression, impression the brain then just has this confirmation bias where it's going to look to, to kind of reinforce that initial judgment, whether that was correct or not. So as a result, we really need to deal with the neuroscience and it doesn't always have to be through a high touch. It can be very simple, even through a tech touch. So for example, uh, we want some closure. So with that solar uh, vendor, uh, all they had to do was to send, it could have been an automated email saying, thank you for your, you know, your, your business. Thank you for trusting us. Here are the next steps. One, you'll get a, um, a, a call from, from Maria. They'll schedule the technician. Two, this technician will come out. Three, um, we'll schedule the, the construction. Like that's all that was needed. Maybe a, 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 an automated email. That will give me cognitive closure from the buyer journey and help me start the, um, the customer journey. Next, start with the familiar. Now, I, I work with a lot of companies where they might have a really fancy uh, software tool with analytics and dashboards and reporting, but the customers are really stuck on using what's familiar 
spreadsheets, right? They're really stuck in using their spreadsheets and maybe you have that experience as well. So you wanna start with the familiar and talk about how what they're used to using, spreadsheets, and then talk about how your product relates to spreadsheets, how they're gonna use it in a similar way to spreadsheets, and then you can move from there. Because otherwise people will resist that because they like to stay with what's familiar. I really like using visual images to help people show see the journey. We'll talk about that later. And then small talk. So when you're having meetings with people, hey, talk about you know what's familiar, what's uh, what you're both uh, uh, connected with. Maybe um, uh, you know the weather is always a, a, an easy thing. I always like to look people up on LinkedIn and find out if we know the same people. Maybe I've visited their city that they live in. Uh, maybe they've lived where I live. So so we get some kind of small talk going, and that actually helps to kind of lubricate the connection and build small talk, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and build trust. So it's really important at the beginning of a relationship that you build trust. So you provide those clear endings and beginnings that we talked about. You help the buyers know what happens after the deal closes. You don't just wait. And uh, we'll talk more about that. You get to know the people that you work with and you help the customers adopt your product. You don't just throw it at them and hope they know they know how to use it and get value from them. You really gotta bridge that gap. So any questions coming in, Tori and Rayvon, that we wanna address? Sure, we have a great question coming in from Steve. Any tips on starting with the familiar when our organization seems to condemn when we compare our product to other more established products? Well, you may, maybe, uh, you don't have to necessarily compare yourself to the other product, but you can maybe compare what, you know, the thing is maybe have they used those other products, you know, so, but you might talk about it in general um, about if they're familiar with using the, the concepts or the context or the tools. So for example, um, trying to think of an example, like let's say, I, I like to use like gym and personal trainer kind of analogies. So for example, let's say you're my personal trainer, um, you might tell me about protein drinks and you don't have to tell me about brands, but you can just ask me, have I ever used any protein drinks? And just talk about the context, the concepts of using protein drinks. And maybe as you try to get me to use your protein drink. So it doesn't have to be specific about the brand but about the, the kind of the, the tools in general. Okay, okay. and then we have another. Oh, go, go oh, ahead. Sorry. We have another question coming from Ryan. Ryan wants to know, when do you recommend introducing the onboarding team? That's a great question. Um, and let me just see, I'm gonna answer that kind of as we go and you can bring that back. Um, yeah, I'm gonna answer that as we go. And then I'm gonna, if I don't, Tori, will you remind me? Absolutely. So I'm going to I'm going to um, I'm going to weave that in. So the key is to partner with customers, and you might have a very high touch approach. You might have a low touch approach. You might have a a digital approach. It really doesn't matter. You can still partner with them. But the main thing is to remember that your customers are people. So even though you might think we're dealing with this company Acme, you know, you might think we got logos, we got customers, we have accounts. The reality is we work with people. And everyone has these neurological responses, whether they know they're having them or not, whether they want them or not. So here are things that I recommend you do to help build trust, to partner with customers, and to ensure you're successful by making them successful. Okay, one is show the journey ahead. So um, what I like to do in very visual way, help them understand what happens after the buyer journey. So we talked about that with the solar panel vendor, just tell me what's gonna happen next. You know what, I, uh, we also, I, I, I moved into a new house a year ago, and uh, so we've been working with a lot of vendors. So one of the vendors, they work with a um, product called Service Titan, which coincidentally my nephew works at, but they're so awesome, like they, I scheduled the appointment uh, for the, um, the, the consultant to come out and you know do an analysis on our house, and they sent me a link to a webpage Here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to be have prepared. I was so impressed. 
Now, I like to use visual images because guess what? You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is my orchestrated onboarding framework, which shows like, here's the journey that we're on. We have an embark, we do a handoff, we do a kickoff. It doesn't have to look like mine, but when I work with companies, we design something that works for you. So we're showing the journey ahead so that the deal doesn't close. And then your customers are just sitting in the dark wondering about what's going to happen next. You don't want them wondering. You want them to, you want to fill in the gap so that, that their brain doesn't start uh, ruminating and prospecting and, and uh, creating worst case scenarios. So you want to give them a visual. Oftentimes I see, you know, these huge project plans and people can't process that. So a visual really helps the neurologically, we kind of go, oh, we get it. And then we can move on. Now, um, so the next thing is to have, show them the goal, the plan, the success. And you need to transfer that from the sales team to the customer facing teams, whether that's customer success, onboarding, et cetera. Now, later in this session, I'll give you a QR code where you can download my very popular success plan template. Now in this success plan template, we really get clear, you know, I do this when I work with companies, what are, what are the goals? What are the outcomes? What are the roles and responsibilities? What are the risks we may need to address? How are we going to communicate? What are some quick wins? We talk about all that. So again, we have that agreement about how we're going to work together. Now, back to that question about when do we introduce the onboarding team? Now, I personally, when I work with companies, I like to have the customer success manager engage first because I like them to talk about all this big picture stuff and not dive right into the implementation stuff because all that technical project plan stuff just overwhelms customers. So we talk about the big picture first, just like we, um, I went over with my um, orchestrated onboarding framework. We talk about here's the journey ahead. And then, so that's where we have the embark stage and the handoff stage. And then in the kickoff stage, once we start diving into the implementation and onboarding specifics, that's when I'd like to introduce the onboarding specialists because they're usually more technical and tactical and the customer success manager needs to be more strategic and big picture. All right, next, you really wanna increase transparency and communication. And I gotta tell you, this is where technology can really help you. There are tools like GuideCX who's sponsoring us today where they have onboarding software tools. And this is really helpful because, you know, I work with companies where, you know, the customers really don't know what's going on. They don't know who's got the ball. They don't know what's what's been done. They don't know what's needed next. They don't know what the timelines are. And maybe you and your team are managing that really well. But remember, we need to partner for, with, for success. We need to partner with customers. So I really recommend having the customers able to be, you know, have things assigned to them, knowing what all the deadlines are, knowing what's been accomplished, knowing um, everything that's required so they are accountable and engaged. And then you've got to take complete ownership. So you really need to, you know, guide customers along a journey of best practices to ensure that they get value, that you don't just hope that customers do what you ask for. You know, a lot of customers, um, customer facing teams that I work with, they kind of let the customers, um, I would say, uh, uh, guide them around. Hey, customer, what do you feel like today? What would delight you? Well, let's say, again, we're gonna go back to that personal trainer analogy uh, to that question with Steve. Let's say Steve's my personal trainer and Steve says, hey, Donna, what kind of workout do you feel like today? And I say, well, you know, Steve, I had a late night last night. Um, I'm kind of tired. What about if we go out for coffee? I'd love to get to know you better. Well, that might delight the customer in the moment, but it does not deliver results. So you need to have that program, that approach that you know that delivers results, and then make sure customers stick to it. So you, sometimes they might be cursing your name. You're going to make sure that they are working hard, that they're accountable, so that they reach their goals and you reach yours. And then I really like to help companies look on, look at how to deliver value quickly. So maybe it takes three months, six months, nine months, maybe more than a year to go live with your product. But are there ways that you can deliver some initial value 
maybe rather than that trough of disillusionment, the antidote to that trough is some quick wins, some uh, some initial value, some ongoing value. And sometimes, you know, we talked about starting with the familiar. Maybe your product takes weeks or months to deploy, but can you help them with, you know, bridging that gap from what's familiar to how they are, need to have the right mindsets, the right concept, the right context to be successful with your product so that value doesn't have to be waiting till they can log into your product. It might be helping them learn how to think so that when your product is live, they can dive right in and really thrive using it. Every time you deliver value to your customers, they get an endorphin hit. An endorphin is a feel-good chemical get, that gets released in the brain. So remember, we're talking about the brain. Rather than dwelling in fear, doubt, disillusionment, let's get them excited to be working together because then they're, they won't ghost you. They're going to stay engaged. They're going to be successful, and you won't have to put on the cape and be that reactive hero. So to sum it up, I like to talk about customer success is like going to the gym. So on the left here, we have uh, a, a, like a restaurant serving a meal uh, versus a, a lifting a weight going to the gym. So I like to compare go, uh, going to a restaurant versus going to the gym. Now, customer success is like going to the gym. Let's talk about going to a restaurant. When you go to the restaurant, it's a transaction. You place your order and then you wait. And then the, the cooks go and they, you know, the chef, the cooks, they, the team, they, they create your meal. They serve it to you while you passively wait. You consume your, your food. You pay generally afterwards. They clean up after you, right? It's done. It's a transaction. It's over. And, um, but when you go to the gym, it's a partnership. You need to be accountable. So you don't just pay your money. Generally, in fact, you pay up front, right? You pay every month, whether you go or not, and you don't see any results unless you show up. You gotta show up, you have to lift some weights, you might raise your heart rate, you might breathe hard, you might groan, you might perspire, you might get a great endorphin hit, right? Because you're working out. And it's not like you're gonna see all these great results just from going once. You got to have consistency, you're gonna to have to change uh, what you do. You might have to wake up earlier, create some time in your schedule. And it's the consistency and the effort that, um, that deliver the results. And what I'd like you to do is start thinking that way with the customers and helping them understand at the very beginning how they need to partner with you. That, for example, you're gonna create this plan, success plan you're gonna create this plan for success. You're gonna give them, help give them that transparency and communication so that they know what's expected of them. You're gonna take complete ownership, just like you're a trainer. You're gonna help them see that journey ahead, right? And so you need to partner with them and really help them along this, this journey together where you are on the journey together. And there's this great quote from McKinsey that says, you know, when you improve that customer journey and experience, it's not just like, okay, we got an onboarding specialist. It really in requires the whole organization to work together. It's everyone who's working with customers. And there's huge reward because it's not just higher customer satisfaction, you actually get higher employee satisfaction, you actually make more money, you actually save more money, and it gives you a competitive advantage. It's gonna set you apart from your competitors because let's face it, oftentimes what sets you apart is not so much your product, even though it's awesome, is how you engage with your customers. All right, so we're gonna start opening up the line for some Q&A. In the meantime, go ahead and dive into this QR code. I have a whole slew of valuable and exclusive resources available for you. You can download my success plan template. Um, I have a new offering, which is Next Level Coaching, which is a way to help you reach the next level and your customers reach the next level. And I also have my popular customer onboarding masterclass, my orchestrated onboarding masterclass. I'm working on days for September, so you can always uh, email me and let me know that you're interested.
All right, so we'll pause there. And um, and actually I'm gonna um, just, I'll come back to this, but my the thing that I wanna focus, what I the one thing I want you to remember is how will you transform your customer's business? You're not just going live with your, your product. When you transform their business, they're gonna be thriving and you're gonna thrive as well because they're gonna take you on that journey of increased usage and championing your product. Here, uh, here are ways you, that we can stay connected. And I want you to remember that when customers win, you win. Here's all my contact info. And then during the Q&A, we'll, um, we'll pop back to the QR code so you get that. So uh, I'm happy to uh, take your questions. Thank you for such a great presentation, Donna. Before we dive into questions, I want to remind everyone that now's the time to get straight from the source insight from Donna Weber. Great questions contribute to a great webinar, so don't forget to submit some questions. Additionally, we understand if you need to run. Just know that today's session is being recorded and will be emailed to you within the next 48 hours. If we don't get to your questions today, you can you can connect with Donna via social media, which is up on the screen, and we will put in the chat. Okay, we've got a lot of great questions coming in. Our first one comes from Jen. Jen says, we are a SaaS company who does not interact with clients often. Any tips on making our software onboarding process more intuitive? Oh, I think I need more information, Jen. We might want to have some uh, uh, offline chats. Um, you know, the thing is, you need to, I'm going to um, stop sharing and, and, um, and let me just do stop sharing. Okay, there we go. The thing is, um, is how do you make it more intuitive? Well, the question is, uh, what do your customers want and need? So I would start with learning from your customers what they want and need, and then uh, find out are there ways you can do some in-product guidance? Are there ways that you can do um, some um, uh, a journey of best practices that you can guide customers along? Um, it, 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 it starts with knowing your customers and what's intuitive to them. I want to know if you have any onboarding stories of one that went wrong and one that went right and the big difference between them. Also, any great tips from moving from the salesperson to the account manager for a strong handoff process? Oh, so, you know, um, here are some great stories. Here's a great story of, of onboarding that went wrong. Um, I worked with a company, they do health tech, and uh, what was happening was um, the, the sales reps were closing, um, all, you know, any potential client. They were all about hitting their sales numbers. So they were like, time kills all deals. Don't talk to my prospects. And they were, you know, closing deals off the charts, but they were closing to anybody, even if they were poor fit. And so the implementation onboarding teams were stuck trying to cram these poor fit customers into their products and um, onboardings were taking way too long and what was um, you know first we were looking at the costs of the long onboarding the long implementations and um, we were looking to reduce it by 20 percent but what was really costing the company was that the implementation teams were having to deal with frustrated customers who were pausing and canceling their subscriptions and we, they, as a result, they had to pull back the, they had to bring the sales rep back in, they had to bring the buyer back in, and they had to bring the legal team back in to redraw uh, the contracts because customers were so frustrated. When we looked at what that cost the company, not just in time and labor, but in all the opportunity costs, because the sales reps, they were called these resales, they were doing all these resales rather than out there selling, it was costing the company a half a million dollars a year. So what we did was we, um, we uh, so you know, to turn that uh, uh, bad story into a good story, what we did was we created a journey of best practices and I helped them design that. And then uh, we uh, had the customer success manager engage earlier. We talked about an ideal customer profile so that they wouldn't sell all these poor fit and we had the customer success manager engage earlier to help ensure that the customer was ready so that they could really get the implementation going. The implementation team was um, introduced a little later 
and um, we got them focused on just engaging during the implementation because they were had been getting pulled in all throughout the customer journey. So we engaged the customer success manager earlier to deal with that big picture stuff we talked about today. And then the implementation team were like the surgeons just in there for those very specific operations. And what was the second question, Tori? Um, if you have any tips for moving from the salesperson to the account manager for a strong handoff process. Well, that's where um, in my um, orchestrated onboarding framework, I'm gonna go back to sharing. In my orchestrated onboarding framework during Embark, this is during the sales journey. This is where I help customers see that journey ahead so they know what happens after the deal closes. Then we have a handoff stage, and this is where we have a customer handoff so that the customers on the, the you know, the users on the customer side know what's happening. We also have an internal handoff from this post pre-sales team to the post-sales team. And so we have this handoff, and um, I bake that into the customer journey, into the onboarding journey, so that we don't just uh, jump right into the kickoff. So that, that's something we do, we bake that in. And um, what the ways that help that happen are for the post sales, the onboarding teams, the customer success teams to get as much as they can during the buyer journey so that they're not asking customers, hey, customer, tell me what your goals are. Tell me what your, um, tell me what, uh, why you bought our products. So they get a lot of that and then they can have a, a very quick meeting maybe with a sales rep just to kind of get ready to be successful with the customer. Our next question comes from Daniela. How do you drive change in the organization to accomplish these objectives? Everyone knows it's the right thing to do for the customer, but gets stuck in the silos. Yes, silos are familiar. So what I recommend doing is using data, using metrics. So what you might wanna do, so let's go back to that handoff. You know, you might say, hey, Donna Weber says we should do a handoff. Hey, I think we should do handoffs. And no one wants to do them. So what you might do is start to find some evidence of the impact. So for example, you might look at um, maybe there is, let's say we talked with Ryan earlier today, Ryan asked a question. Maybe you find out of all the sales reps, Ryan is really open to doing a handoff. So you say, hey, Ryan, what, let's, let's do a little experiment. What I'd like to do is do a handoff because it, you know most likely you will make more money if we do these handoffs. So we're gonna do handoffs with all your customers and let's just start to measure um, your customers compared to other, custom, other customers who don't get the handoffs. So you wanna get a baseline metric and compare it. So you're gonna do kind of like an A-B testing here, right? or the controlled group versus the experiment. You're gonna do an experiment. Hey, Ryan, let's just see what happens when we do the handoffs. Uh, you might find, these are things you might pay attention, onboarding happens faster. Well, look at that, onboarding happened, it's, it, 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 it took two weeks less time, and that's gonna save our company hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of a year. So you might show, look, we do a handoff, and we save the company money. Okay, maybe we did this handoff and we did like a success plan, right, with Ryan's customers, because Ryan gets it and Ryan's open to it. So you kind of start at this grassroots level. You might find, look at this, Ryan's customers start buying and expanding more quickly. Ryan's actually making more money because of that. So that would be a great thing. Sales reps would love to know that. Then when they see what's in it for them, they're going to be all over it. So it really, so let's say you want to break down a silo with support. Hey, support, you know, when we can do this uh, orchestrated onboarding process, you actually get less support tickets. It's going to save your team money. So that's where you want to start to show them the benefit for them. You might want to start with some experiments and just kind of, you know, try and try, you know, rather than trying to roll out this whole organization wide approach, it might take a year. To get, to get all that buy-in, start with some simple anecdotal evidence. So here's an example. Um, I worked at a company before I started my business over seven years ago, where internally everyone thought all the customers are unique. 
They need highly technical experts during onboarding and, um, and beyond. And I called BS to that. I said, that that's not true. There's no way that our company can scale if we stay with this model. And I, no, I didn't ask for permission. You know, there's a saying, you don't ask for permission, you ask for forgiveness. I interviewed 10 customers. So we talked about this earlier today. You need to learn from your customers. I asked customers some open-ended questions, and these are things that I can help you with. And what I heard the customers say over and over, like verbatim, was we don't need a technical expert. We need like a quarterback to guide the journey. Now, a quarterback is the person who is on the offense in American football, and they guide the journey, right? They need someone who's going to kind of tell them the play. So even though I called BS to that earlier, nobody would listen to me internally. I interviewed customers. I started sharing direct quotes and it started to transform the company. And as a result, we built out this orchestrated onboarding framework before it was orchestrated onboarding. That was like the, the initial, uh, my initial way of doing that. We broke down internal silos. Eventually we created a whole customer success organization and, and, and had a CCO. I mean, that all took kind of a, probably the course of a year, but that was the seed. So that's what I, I encourage you to do is start listening to customers and experimenting. We have a great question coming in from Arthur. Any suggestions on how to set expectations around timelines? I would like to discuss this more effectively up front with clients, but it's not always immediately clear to me what's realistic right away. And it also can be dependent on customers getting things done on their end. I want to communicate this clearly so clients know what to expect and I can hold them to account, but I also want it to be realistic. Yeah, absolutely. I think it will one, and um, let's go back to this, um, this here, this success plan. So when you, um, when you see this, can you see the success plan? Yeah. One, that's that, what I do is we talk about who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulted, who's informed. We talk about timelines. So for example, um, uh, these are these are real stories here. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, there we go. Real, real stories, you know, I was working with a company and we were talking about the timeline and they're like, well, you know what? We're releasing um, our next product comes out in October. We're, we need all hands on deck. And so we paused the whole project for a month, the whole month of October. So we, we, we have that agreement during the success plan. Um, or let's say, hey, um, uh, Arthur, um, we find out Arthur is going to be on paternity leave and, um, and uh, somebody else needs to step up, even though Arthur's the project lead on the customer side. So we have those conversations. We talk about risks. We talk about um, how, how we're going to escalate. Uh, any blockers, we talk about the, all that, so we get very realistic. So I, when I work with companies, we don't hope everything's gonna be successful. We don't cross our fingers. We talk about the hard stuff up front. And then guess what? You know, I talked about this take complete ownership. I'm gonna share my slide again, take complete ownership. So um, then when the, the, when the blockers appear, when issues come up, we have an agreement on how we deal with them and we deal with them immediately. So again, real real story, I was working with a company that um, that was um, uh, one of the folks on the project team from the customer side uh, was holding the team hostage, was being passive aggressive. She was um, a, a, a longtime expert, but was being very difficult to work with. And we determined that the escalation was I would, um, I would call the CEO on their mobile if anything was blocking success. So guess what? I called the CEO and said, hey, this person is holding the team hostage, is being passive aggressive, has slowed the whole project down. And we agreed to keep her as somebody who was consulted, but not um, on the project team. And the moment she was removed, everything moved, what got right back on track. So um, absolutely, we talk about timelines, um, we talk about I, what I can. What I do is often show here's here's the time frame, but we'll fine tune it for you once we've had that conversation about the success plan. That success plan conversation has to happen first. You might have 
here's what our usual time frame looks like, but we want to make sure this works for you. And this is only going to work if your team is accountable. So we have those conversations, just like if I was going to work out with Steve as my trainer, he's going to tell me, look, I'm going to kick your butt. You're not going to see results unless you do these things. You know, you got to, you got to take that complete ownership. Thank you, Donna. Our next question comes from Michelle. A big challenge my organization has is the bridge between sales closing the buyer's journey and transitioning to our client success team to start the customer onboarding experience. Often they fail to introduce us and then the relationship building is just lost. What is the best way to reinforce this importance? Yeah, I think we talked about that. You know, I'm sorry that 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 that's happening is if it, you know sometimes like there's the idea that you like you create a plan you're going to roll it out and you got to you know everyone's going to do it and sometimes that doesn't work well first of all you really need to get the 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 buy in from the sales leaders because they're not going to um kind of they're not going to enforce that stuff um uh, uh, uh unless, you know unless they know it it helps so you know some companies they say that um, the sales reps don't get compensated till the onboarding is complete. Well, guess what? Sales reps really show up. They do the handoffs. They do the introductions. They they stay engaged, making sure that the, the um, that the customers get what they need. So, um, are you able to see my screen right now? I mean, me right now. Yes, we're able to see you. Okay, great. I just couldn't see my end. Um, so. So that's what, and some companies they do that, but that's got to have that buy-in from the leadership. So if you're not getting the buy-in from the leadership, then that's where you do this kind of organic grassroots. You might find there is, you know, I've talked with companies where some sales reps are, don't you talk to my customers? Uh, or they're off to the next deal. And some are like, you know what? Um, at one company, the uh, head of sales off said, Customers need to see the path to success, and they got it. I've also talked with other sales reps who really get it. So find the sales reps who get it and start kind of test driving some of these things we've talked about, and then start to see the impact. And if they this sales rep gets more, it gets better results, and they can start to share that with other sales reps, and that carries more weight than what you think, unfortunately. <laughs> Our next question comes from Susan, and it's in reference to the gym analogy. How do you support self-onboarding clients to commit to the effort required to onboard? Well, again, you need to help them see the journey ahead. So they're not just going to, you know, so for example, um, you know, I joined a new gym recently. Um, it would have been great if they scheduled a free um, uh, session to help give me a tour of the gym and show me how to use all the equipment because some of the equipment to be honest, I still don't know how to use. That would be a great onboarding it for a gym, right? Um, uh, and um, so, uh, so you need to kind of, you know, kind of hold their hand physically or digitally to get them to success. What I like to do is, let's say, is um, if it's a self-paced journey, is do like in-product guidance, um, where you maybe you have a journey where you're taking them to some value. If all you're doing is helping them log in and give them a tour of their of your product, that's meaningless. You got to make sure we talked about delivering. I'm going to go back to that slide. Uh, delivering some value quickly. So if they get some like an aha on a, an aha moment, a magic moment, where they go, oh God, thank God I'm using your product, then you then they're going to stick around and, and try more. So um, if you could get some product in, in product guidance where you're guiding them to some initial value quickly, that's going to really be helpful. Our next question comes from Christina. We're going to be doing a customer focus group later in the year to ask many of the items you went over. Do you recommend any questions or guidance on that process? And just for a bit of clarification, they're an ownership-based company that requires equity into our business yeah well things that I, I i mean it depends on what you want to learn from them and what you're going to do as a result of what you're going to learn so uh, but the, i like to ask open-ended questions um you know if, if you really want to learn about onboarding and there were some some customers who were recently onboarded then i like to ask tell me you know what uh, how your onboarding experience was what worked uh, what worked well? What would what suggestions for improvement do you have? Um, 
I like to ask them, tell me about an awesome onboarding experience you had with another vendor. So we find out what's, what's uh, meaningful for them. Because remember, our customers are not just working with you. They're working with many companies and many products. Um, I like to ask them, if you had a magic wand, what's the one thing you would change today that really gets people thinking out of the box? So those are a handful of questions that I like. But the main thing, you know, you don't bring together a, let's say a focus group or during a customer business review, you don't just talk at them. You don't just talk about your product. You don't just talk about your solution. You wanna listen. And so you wanna find out what's working well, uh, what would you improve? Um, you know, how do, how do we compare to some other companies you've worked with? Thank you. And it looks like we have time for just a few more questions here. Our next one comes from Jen. We only interact with a small percentage of customers who actually sign up for a trial of our software. While we have a high conversion rate with those folks, what tips do you have for increasing conversion rates in the percentage of people who don't sign up for demos? Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, it's got to be value, 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 value. So are you delivering value in the trials? Um, you know, again, if you're, if they're just like, I, I, you know, there was a company, which I won't name, they had, um, uh, uh, um, uh, billboards all up the freeway, up and down the freeway, whenever I drive to San Francisco. And, um, and I, 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 you know, I got the free trial and I had no idea what to do. I'm like, so what, you know? So, so you need to be able, like, if you're going to log in and do a free trial, they need to get to some value. So uh, that might again be some in product, like a little walkthroughs. Um, it may be a um, an email campaign that not, isn't just throwing information at them, but helping them to do specific things so that they get to the value. And then if they haven't done it, so um, I did a trial of a um, of another tool where I got emails and they would say, "Hey, here, thank you for 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 you know signing up. Here's the first thing you need to do." You need to import all your contacts, all your customers. And I didn't do that. So then it kept reminding me to do that. And it said, well, if you don't want to, after it reminded me a couple of times, it said, well, if you don't want to import your customers, here's our um, sample customer list you can import. So I imported that. And then they say, oh, congratulations, you imported your customers. Now you can create reports. Now you can do this. So it was, a, it was very um, dependent on the usage, what I was doing. So it wasn't just, um, randomly showing me things it was very specific driving me along a, a journey value a value journey our next question is in regards to journey maps and it comes from Craig journey maps are often visually powerful regarding your figure eight orchestrated onboarding journey map it connects steps one through six in a sense is it a loop from your perspective so um, this is my orchestrated onboarding framework. And, um, and so the, I would say that, you know, this is when I work with companies, helping them to build something. Um, because, you know, from my perspective, onboarding is ongoing. So it's a double infinity loop because it's not just, um, you know, we reach a place. So, so then um, uh, I, I, I'm not, it, it will take me a few minutes to open up and find some other slides. But what I do when I work with companies is we create some visuals that show the journey ahead and they, they, they're they relevant to their branding and they're, um, they're, and they're tailored to how they work. So uh, for example, one company I worked with, they had um, uh, rather than, um, uh, in order to, rather than waiting for these long implementations, they had projects. So they kind of had these ongoing loops. Um, so they had like an initial use case, they go live with that, and then they'd start the next use case. So it might, uh, another company we built kind of stair steps. So it, it's really uh, relevant to how your um, company does, has that journey. But I do really like a visual, and I really like to use words that are customer, relevant that are meaningful and aspirational to both customers and customer facing teams because it helps keep everyone more engaged thank you donna and our final question comes from nancy nancy wants to know if you can share some best practices for sharing information with customers during onboarding and post deployment that is not always 
drinking from the fire hose. It's a hard balance. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna go back to another slide over here. Nancy is that value drip. So you wanna do this value drip rather than uh, delivering everything at once. Now I have a quote that I like to, this is not mine, but we wanna focus on transformation, not information. So when you create this value journey, and I do have an article um, on my website call about creating a value journey. And so you're not just dumping everything out on them at once. You need to like know, you know this might take some research, like what are the things that when customers do in our products, they're really sticky? Or what are the things that when they do that first, then they stick around and keep using more? So, so you need to do, you might need to understand product usage metrics. Uh, you might need to know some aha moments where then you guide some users to some initial value and then you keep taking them on that journey. So for example, uh, to loop in a couple of things we talked about today, when I worked at a company with, um, we had an analytics product, so we're creating reports, right? A lot of our users were really into their spreadsheets. They, they often would not want to stop using their spreadsheets, right? Because they built in conditional formatting, they had their pivot tables, right? They didn't want to change, even though our product was so much more sophisticated. So what I did was the um, we would take them, we would we would do the um, get the product to go out with some initial reports built in, right? So that they didn't have to start by building a report. Then we got them using those initial reports. We talked about them in terms related to their spreadsheet, so they could relate to them from a spreadsheet. We got them then. Uh, uh, um, customizing, sorry, um, uh, changing, customizing those existing reports. So now they start with a familiar report. Then we got them from there, start to create new reports so that we, we didn't just dive into creating a report. That was like too much. So then we got them creating some simple reports. And then the next step would be to create complex reports. So we took them on a whole journey of how to engage and adopt the reporting components. We didn't just dive them in there and show them everything about reporting at once. That would just overwhelm them and keep them stuck on their familiar spreadsheets. Thank you, Donna. And that is all the time we have for today. I hope you all learned just as much as I did. Thank you to our sponsor, GuideCX, and our incredible speaker, Donna Weber, for taking the time to answer our burning questions and giving us such wonderful information. A huge thank you to you all for attending. I'm Tori, and I hope you have a productive rest of your week. Thank you, Tori. Thanks for hosting, and uh, uh, please reach out. I look forward to continuing the conversation with everyone.